So yeah, as he mentioned today, I will be talking about light exposure and uh, cancer-related symptoms. I'm currently based at Aarhus University and Aarhus University Hospital, but I also have affiliations with Northwestern University and actually also Mount Sinai in New York. Um, so I'll be talking about all of the work that we've done uh, over the recent years um, relating light exposure and cancer-related symptoms, as well as circadian rhythm work as well. So as an overview, I'm going to begin today by talking about the cancer symptom cluster and describe what that is. And then I'll go on to talk about circadian rhythms in general, and then uh, entrainment of circadian rhythms and what that means. And finally, light and cancer symptoms. Now, I know that much of this group may be interested in circadian rhythms or circadian biology already, um, but I will be explaining some of the fundamental concepts. Um, so if you already know it, just uh, bear with me. But if you don't, well, welcome to this world, this very interesting world to me at least. So firstly, what is the cancer symptom cluster? Well, the cancer symptom cluster is basically a range of co-occurring symptoms that tend to occur following cancer and or its treatment. Um, they include fatigue, cognitive impairment, sleep disturbance, and depressed mood. And they tend to uh, exacerbate each other and contribute to each other's intensity um, over time as well. So they're not just correlated, but they can contribute to each other over time. And indeed, in the study, the figure on the right, which is by, from a paper by Shu and colleagues, they examined symptoms in breast cancer patients and indeed found associations between a range of these symptoms um, over, uh, over time. And it's not surprising that this occurs because the cancer trajectory consists of a range of very severe health events from diagnosis to uh, actual treatments, including surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and hormone therapy, which can occur particularly in breast cancer patients and even prostate cancer patients over many years. All of these can be neurotoxic events, including the cancer itself and may persist long into the future, well beyond treatment completion. And as I mentioned, these symptoms may exacerbate each other's intensity and development over time. Um, now, when we think about underlying mechanisms of these symptoms, it can be helpful to look at the various mechanisms that have been examined in the literature uh, and they include endocrine disruption, immune response, mitochondrial dysfunction and oxidative stress, DNA damage, and neurotransmitter dysregulation. But the underlying mechanism that has become very interesting to myself and my colleagues is actually circadian dis rhythm disruption, because it happens to be highly associated with all of the other mechanisms described above it. Moreover, circadian rhythms are highly modifiable and therefore it is a mechanism that interests interests me in particular as a psychologist and uh, may be contributing uh, through that mechanism cancer and its treatment may contribute to fatigue sleep mood and cognition uh, changes through that mechanism in addition to others so when we think about circadian rhythms, what are they exactly? Well, they are endogenous rhythms. They are predictable cycles of rhythmicity, approximate 24 hour cycles of rhythmicity in our behavior, our physiology and our biochemistry. And as mentioned, they are endogenous, meaning they are um, intrinsically rhythmic and generated from our bodies they are controlled by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is situated in the hypothalamus. Uh, 
it is our central circadian pacemaker or our master clock that occurs in the brain. So if you look in the figure on the left, you can see a little clock there that's kind of pointing to where the suprachiasmatic nucleus is located. And we have a range of rhythms in our body, including cortisol rhythms, uh, melatonin rhythms. Melatonin tends to rise as our bodies prepare for rest and then decline over the course of the day. Cortisol tends to rise in the morning and go down later in the day. We have rhythms in other systems in the body, including even our alertness and memory and mood. Um, and the purpose of circadian rhythms is actually to prepare our body for restful sleep at some times of the day and active wakefulness at others. Um, but because our circadian rhythms are actually slightly longer than the 24 hour day, they actually need to be entrained to our environment through various zeitgebers uh, or time givers. There are peripheral zeitgebers as shown there, which includes the timing of when we engage in activity or eat, environmental temperature, for example. Um, these are our peripheral, peripheral zeitgebers, uh, but the strongest zeitgeber of all is actually light, light exposure. And that can include light um, from our environment, but even artificial light. And that happens to be the strongest zeitgeber of all. Uh, and this occurs actually through cells in our retina called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. I won't go into great detail about them, but it's part of our non-visual system. And those cells project directly to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain as well as, um, uh, and light also uh, projects to other parts of our brain that can be important to our behavior and how we feel. Um, but um, the wavelength that they are most sensitive to happens to be around 470, 480 nanometers. And that happens to be the blue light range, which you may have heard about when you think about light therapy devices, for example, or exposure to light from our um, cell phones, for example. Now, when we think about, um, I'll skip ahead to, oh, what happened? Okay. So let me just backtrack here. Okay. So when we're thinking about cancer patients and cancer survivors, it's important for us uh, before we even think about potential ways to entrain circadian rhythms is to think about, do we even have circadian disruption in uh, cancer patients? And so recently, Ali Amidi and I, who are, who's a colleague of mine at Aarhus University, undertook a review of the literature and we examined uh, studies that looked at circadian disruption in cancer patients, both during and after treatment, and um, as well as due to the cancer itself. And we did find uh, a number of key studies that found associations between cancer and its treatment and circadian disruption. In addition to that, we also found associations between that circadian disruption and um, cancer and treatment related symptoms, including sleep disturbance, cognitive impairment, fatigue, and depression. As an example, um, a number of the studies actually focused on um, measurement of circadian rhythms using actigraphy. So if we think about actigraphy, actigraphy can be, actigraphy is basically a measure of our movement uh, on our wrist. So when we use actigraphy, we have someone wear a watch-like device that measures our movements. And those movements are supposed to represent um, or be a proxy for circadian rhythms. Essentially, we're measuring circadian activity rhythms. And so when someone is healthy, we see a density of activity during the day and almost no activity at night, indicating that the person is probably sleeping well and has robust healthy activity during the day. So uh, the, uh, right here in this figure, we can see a healthy actogram. 
But in cancer patients, we see even prior to treatment that there's already disruption to that circadian rhythm, circadian activity rhythm. We see more disruption at night, indicating that they're having more trouble sleeping probably. Uh, and their activity is a little more erratic during the day. And by say cycle four of chemotherapy for a breast cancer patient here, uh, we see an actogram here of a typical patient where there's high disruption both during the day and the night indicating disruption to their circadian rhythms. <clears throat> and we see associations between disrupted circadian rhythms and various uh, cancer symptoms, which we, um, I use the term cancer symptoms to describe cancer and treatment related symptoms, including fatigue, depression, and mood here. Um, if we look at those dark bars, dark bars indicate patients with less regular circadian rhythms. This is in um, breast cancer patients. And the lighter bars are those with more regular circadian rhythms. And you can see that in each case, the symptomatology is greater in individuals with less regular circadian rhythms. So we do see circadian disruption in cancer patients. And this is really important because the circadian system, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> is a highly modifiable target and may be used in cancer patients to prevent or treat cancer side effects and symptoms. So right now I'm gonna go through some of the work that we've undertaken in light and cancer symptoms, which as I mentioned before, includes um, the symptoms associated with cancer and or its treatment. <clears throat> when we think about light uh, in this context and we talk about light therapy, for example, we're actually talking about a range of different possible devices that can be used. Um, that, that can include light goggles, it can include um, light boxes, like the blue one there, um, which can be positioned at, um, at someone's desk, for example, or on a table. And on the right, we have an example of one of the fixtures that we used in a hospital setting at Mount Sinai. Um, and this was in one of the stem cell transplant units. So it can, <clears throat> light therapy essentially consists of a range of different devices but what's most important is not necessarily the type of device itself. What's most important is the light that's hitting the eye. So, you know, sometimes we focus on the intensity of the light, the color temperature of the light. Uh, but what's actually most important is what is hitting the eye and at what time of day. Um, we also have uh, one study that I will be describing where we also looked at ambient light in the hospital room. Um, it was a pilot study, and I'll describe that in greater detail later. <clears throat> the essential rationale for all of these light studies is that cancer and cancer treatment is associated with disruption of circadian rhythms, and that this contributes to cancer-related symptoms. Cancer and cancer treatment can, of course, also directly contribute to cancer-related symptoms. Um, but the mechanism that we're most interested in here is the circadian rhythms and introducing something like systematic bright white light exposure, for example, to resynchronize those circadian rhythms and reduce cancer-related symptoms. And that is the key rationale for all of the studies that I'm presenting. And I'm just gonna focus on some of the studies that we've undertaken um, to kind of demonstrate uh, how we have undertaken this work. Um, a number of the studies have used um, light boxes such as these. So where we've, um, on the left is a bright white light, which is considered the intervention or treatment light. And in this case, this is by the light box company. Uh, and so for these studies, we used Bright white light is the intervention light. They are essentially premium white LED bulbs in there um, with 1350 lux uh, light intensity. But as you can see, uh, the peak wavelength or color temperature is in that blue light range that I described earlier. So close to the, around 475, 480 nanometers. And then we have um, a dim red light box, which is used as a standard comparison condition in many studies. 
And the reason why it's often used is because it is less circadian stimulating. Um, these boxes typically emit less than 50 lux light intensity. And as you can see, it's a longer wavelength light and it's supposedly less circadian stimulating. And for these studies, we've um, given these light boxes to patients. They have taken them home and typically what they've been instructed to use them 30 minutes per day each morning upon awakening. And, you know, for those interested in study design, um, these boxes have typically had on off loggers attached to them so that we could see when they were turned on and off. So in this first study I will describe, we examined a mixed group of cancer survivors and we focused on primarily fatigue. Fatigue was the primary outcome of interest in these survivors, but we also examined a secondary outcome of sleep disturbance. This is the essential study design here, study timeline. So patients, survivors, um, uh, primarily breast cancer patients, some gynecological patients and hematological stem cell transplant patients. So a mixed group of cancer survivors were screened for fatigue um, and using the facet fatigue scale. And those who met the cutoff were randomized to either the bright white light or the dim red light. Uh, and they were assessed at baseline on various questionnaires. And they also um, wore actor watches. They were assessed also mid-intervention of this four week intervention period at the end of the intervention and then three weeks later. These are the primary findings. Essentially, what um, if we look at the y-axis, it represents fatigue scores, where a higher score means less fatigue. So a higher score essentially mean, meant uh, healthier levels of um, energy, less fatigue. And the blue line represents those who use the bright white light box and the red line, the dim red light box. And essentially what you can see there is that all participants were um, had greater fatigue than the clinical cutoff um, at baseline. So they all exceeded the clinical cutoff for fatigue. By two weeks, all of them had, their fatigue levels had reduced significantly. Um, and then by four weeks, um, the red light group, uh, their levels kind of went back to where they were almost, but the bright white light group's fatigue levels dropped significantly over time and this finding was sustained to three weeks later so uh, and were below the clinical fatigue threshold. When we examined sleep efficiency, we found a similar finding. Uh, all of the participants had poor sleep efficiency. In other words, they were below the clinical cutoff. Typically, sleep efficiency, we like it to be 85% or above. And what sleep efficiency means is it's the time, the percentage of time in bed when the person is actually sleeping. So if it's 85%, it means that um, the person was sleeping 85% of the time that they were in bed. Um, so all of them had sleep efficiency below the clinical cutoff at baseline and sleep efficiency improved in the bright white light group and by the end of the intervention, they were, for the most part, below or above the, um, the healthy threshold, but the dim red light group did not improve over time in sleep efficiency. So essentially, we had uh, positive findings. Unfortunately, um, I, I'm not presenting the actigraphy findings here, but we didn't actually see any significant associations with circadian rhythms. Um, of circadian activity rhythms there. In another similar study, we examined breast cancer patients closer to uh, their treatment. So uh, this is breast cancer patients. They were examined two months post radiation. So this was fatigue as well. Very similar design um, as before. They had four weeks of light exposure and they were assessed um, at four time points uh, 
at baseline during uh, the light exposure treatment at the end and then two months later. And what we found was that um, we did not see any differences between groups over time and fatigue levels. So we were curious because basically all of the groups improved significantly. Their fatigue levels dropped significantly in both groups over time. And so we wanted to really determine was this spontaneous recovery, was this a placebo effect or was this an actual effect? So we, after the end of that primary data collection period, we actually collected data on a treatment as usual group. And uh, what we found was that although there was no significant difference between groups over time using linear, linear mixed models, we did see um, slight suppression of the improvement, or well, not suppression, but there was a slower rate of improvement uh, in the treatment as usual group compared with the uh, light therapy groups. <clears throat> In this um, next study, we looked at stem cell transplant survivors, but this time we focused on cognitive impairment, which is another um, symptom in the cancer symptom cluster. This time, patients were screened um, as to whether they had cognitive impairment or not based on a self-report measure. And then they were randomized to the bright white light group or the dim red light group, and they were assessed at baseline on various measures, including neuropsychological tests of cognition, um, as well as various other outcome measures, including fatigue, sleep, et cetera, the usual suspects and mood. Uh, and patients were instructed, these patients were actually stem cell transplant patients who were survivors of treatment. So they were um, at least, I think, six months after treatment and they were instructed to use the light box for four weeks, and then they were assessed at the end of treatment, and then eight weeks later. Looking at uh, their global composite score, which is a sort of overall cognition score, um, typically we look at Z scores of this, and so compared with their baseline scores, they all improved over time um, in both groups. And on self-report, we also saw slight improvement over time. Uh, the, on the right is a self-report um, measure, which is basically the number of impaired items on a self-report measure of cognition. And so there was a slight reduction over time in both groups as well. So again, similar to the study that was undertaken at August University, um, just the previous one in fatigue, uh, there was improvement in both groups, but we weren't sure what that was about. And we unfortunately did not undertake a treatment as usual um, study or a cohort. When we looked at circadian activity rhythms using actigraphy over time, we looked at the robustness using the pseudo F statistic, and we found <clears throat> a slight difference between groups, but this was not significant. Um, although there was a kind of signal that the bright white light group had slightly better um, circadian activity rhythms, but we were not powered to detect an effect between groups on that. In this next study, we looked at stem cell transplant patients during hospitalization. So this time, <clears throat> instead of the light boxes that uh, patients would take home, we actually had light boxes that were installed in the hospital rooms of stem cell transplant patients. And uh, essentially we had bright white light boxes installed that were about 1300 lux. And then dim white light boxes were considered the comparison light condition and they were about 90 lux. And basically these lights were programmed to illuminate from seven to 10 a.m. each day during stem cell transplant um, hospitalization. Now I should mention that stem cell transplant patients, um, I haven't talked much about the patient populations here, but stem cell transplant patients are patients who have hematological malignancies. And typically what happens is they must go through 
um, this very rigorous treatment where essentially they are treated with intensive chemotherapy and uh, sometimes even radiation to basically destroy their existing stem cells. And then they are hospitalized and reinfused either with their own stem cells or a donor's, so their own treated stem cells or a don donor's stem cells. And so when they go through hospitalization, they are incredibly ill and the transplant itself actually looks just like a blood transfusion. Um, and then during their hospitalization, which may last about two weeks or more, they are often feeling quite sick. And as they wait for this, the infused stem cells to infuse with their bodies again. So in this study, as I mentioned, these light boxes were installed in the hospital rooms and they were in addition to their existing light. So um, uh, light is not taken away from the room and then these ones put in. These are light boxes that are installed in addition to whatever light was in there. And the focus of this study was actually on depressed mood primarily. Uh, but patients were not screened for the study because the idea was to try to prevent uh, mood changes and actually um, impairment in fatigue and uh, sleep disruption as well. So they, patients were assessed at baseline on various questionnaires and were then randomized to dim white or bright white light boxes in those um, hospital rooms. Then they were assessed uh, at day two, day seven, and day 14 of their hospitalization. And during that entire period, they were receiving those light boxes, light exposure. And what we found, again here, this is um, the y-axis, uh, a higher score is actually a worse score. So this is on depression scale, this is the CESD. Um, so all of the patients exceeded the clinical cutoff, um, sorry, did not exceed the clinical cutoff for depression at baseline, but by the end of the treatment, um, all of them had uh, imp more impaired depression over time, more impaired depressed mood over time, greater depressed mood. Um, but the bright white light group's uh, depressed mood did not worsen as much as the dim white light group's depressed mood. Uh, and in fact, they didn't quite hit the clinical cutoff actually by day 14 of their um, post-transplant. And this was a significant time by group effect. Finally, I'm going to describe a study where we looked at uh, ambient light in the hospital room. This one was a pilot study that was undertaken at Northwestern. Um, when I started at Northwestern many years ago, in around 2015, I was actually um, introduced to the stem cell transplant unit by one of the treating physicians. We walked around and he pointed out to me actually that um, he was really interested in the work that we were doing. And uh, he pointed out to me that one side of the unit was actually considerably darker than the other side of the unit. So the east facing side of the unit, which is indicated at the top there, um, uh, actually faced um, the lake and received, in his opinion, a lot more light during the day. And the west side of the unit received a lot less um, light. And he felt that the west facing rooms, the dimmer rooms were more depressing. And he wondered whether that might have an effect on how patients felt and potentially even their clinical outcomes. So uh, I don't have the slide here, but we actually um, took a look at the rooms and um, we briefly, looked, we used, because this is a pilot study, um, we actually, on the actor watches, there are light meters on them. We pasted a couple of the watches in the rooms around the height of the patient's heads, um, just to really check to see whether there really was difference differences in light exposure in each of the rooms. And we did see um, a greater amount of cumulative light exposure, particularly of the bright white light 
coming from the east facing units. So we did see a difference between the rooms in terms of light exposure. Um, and for this study, we wanted to look at um, all of the symptoms in the cancer symptom cluster in stem cell transplant patients who were being hospitalized. So here is the study timeline. Uh, patients were assigned to the east or west facing rooms. In other words, bright or dim facing rooms based on availability rather than randomization. So we didn't interfere with the regular clinical practice, but essentially patients were typically put in those east facing rooms first based on availability and um, then the west facing rooms if, if, they were, if all the east facing rooms were taken. Um, so their assignment was not based on clinical any clinical factors, but just convenience, basically. Uh, patients were assessed um, the day of transplant, typically the morning before the infusion or the, the day that they came into the hospital, sometimes the, even the day before, if we could catch them. And they were assessed every day to the extent that they were able to complete these questionnaires. Uh, there was a lot of missing data, um, but when we, uh, and we actually, I don't have the numbers here, but we ended up with about uh, 11 patients in each group. And what we found, even despite the small sample size, was that um, over time, fatigue levels were significantly greater in the West, uh, the dimmer facing room patients. Um, that, that fatigue worsened over time and remained worse, especially after the seven-day mark. And those in the brighter, um, brighter rooms um, fared better in terms of their fatigue levels over time. In terms of total symptom severity, we saw a similar effect. Um, the dimmer west-facing room patients had worse total symptom severity over time than the east-facing rooms. But in terms of self-reported cognition, um, we saw no difference between groups over time. So in conclusion, what our work overall shows us is that exposure to circadian stimulating light may be useful to some degree for relieving or preventing some symptoms in the cancer symptom cluster, uh, particularly fatigue uh, and possibly mood as well. But current ongoing work is also showing us that the picture is not so clear because as you saw from some of the studies, we sometimes saw improvements in both groups, um, but and not necessarily a treatment, uh, a time by treatment effect. In other words, we couldn't necessarily sometimes distinguish a difference between light boxes. So the link between symptoms and circadian rhythm disruption in these studies has also not been fully examined. They've typically been underpowered to really fully examine a mediation effect. In other words, we haven't necessarily been able to statistically analyze whether exposure to a particular light box may lead to improvement in symptoms through um, improvements in circadian rhythm disruption. And in fact, one of the challenges we have in the field is that we haven't really we don't have a sort of gold standard of assessing what circadian rhythm disruption looks like. We can generally see it on uh, an actogram, but uh, no one has come up with a clear cutoff of circadian rhythm robustness using different, uh, um, different possible outcomes. We use the F statistic, which is a measure of fit to a cosine or a function, essentially. And um, so it, the literature or the research is um, not well elaborated in terms of how we can screen for circadian rhythm disruption first. So it's unclear whether our patients even had that. Um, but our, in terms of final thoughts, light is essentially an understudied tool, although it is increasing these days, but um, understudied tool for treating cancer-related symptoms. We still have work to do in this area more work is necessary to determine the nature and severity of circadian rhythm disruption over time. And the link between, between symptoms and circadian rhythm disruption needs to be better established. 
and larger scale efficacy studies are actually necessary and ought to include measures of circadian rhythms. And um, with respect to, um, I am actually using, unfortunately, uh, about 10 minutes before I presented today, I had updated one of the slides and I, I posted the wrong one. But we had, um, we recently published a paper looking, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, about circadian rhythm disruption in cancer patients. And essentially, what we need to see more of are more longitudinal studies and uh, more studies that comprehensively look at a range of different circadian rhythm markers over time. And um, so we have a study that's ongoing. That's the slide I wanted to show. We have a study that's ongoing right now where we're actually looking at breast cancer patients from prior to treatment all the way to a year later. And we will be examining um, activity rhythms, melatonin rhythm, melatonin markers and uh, temperature rhythms and uh, also looking at um, uh, uh, sorry quarter um, sorry um, I'm forgetful in my morning we're lo looking at inflammation as well sorry cytokines as well and so hopefully that will provide us with more information about how circadian rhythms evolve over time in cancer patients. So we need bigger studies, more comprehensive longitudinal studies in these areas to help us better understand how light may be uh, a useful tool, when it might be a useful tool, and under what conditions. Um, these are my primary collaborators and funding sources. Um, so I want to thank my colleagues at Aarhus University, at Northwestern, University of California, San Diego, um, Miami, and Mount Sinai. All of these folks have been have played an important role in these studies over the years, and also, of course, my funding agencies. And this is where I am right now. It's a little later in the morning now than before, so I'm feeling hopefully a little more alert. Um, but this is New Zealand, which is where I'm sitting at the moment. <laughs> 